this lesson is a disturbing topic. Um, maybe before listening, you be aware that you might be upset um, when you're listening to the lecture. Um, it's not something we like talking about is rape. Um, the reason that we are looking at it is to help uh, equip you to better understand what's involved, how people, how people suffer, what they go through, and also to be better equipped at helping them. Um, so it could be upsetting for you, so you're aware of that um, as, I, as I speak. So understanding what rape is um, legally, uh, according to Rape, Abuse and Incest National Network, there's an American organization, sexual assault includes, includes involves sorry, sexual behavior without the consent of the other. So again, this is an American definition. Where you are, the definition could be different. Uh, consent. So what does consent mean? Consent is when a person freely agrees to participate in the activity and has the freedom and capacity to make that choice without constraint. So they cannot be asleep, unconscious, intoxicated, have a mental restriction, be too young to understand what's going on, or be undergoing a medical procedure. So they have to be able to they be able to agree to what's going on. So examples of ignoring consent would be coercion, intimidation, use of physical force of violence, deceiving or threatening, or abuse of authority. Understanding rape, the nature of rape. So sexual assault, assault and rape. Sexual assault includes attempted rape, fondling or unwanted sexual touching, forced sexual acts including oral sex or any penetration of the body, and rape. So rape is when a victim is forcibly penetrated. So what's the motive behind rape? Rape is not about sexual arousal or uncontrollable urges. It's about a desire for power and control. So the perpetrator abuses his greater strength and power over his victim. So different types of rape, stranger rape, that's usually what we think of when we think of someone who's been raped. The perpetrator and victim do not know each other at all. An example would be an alley in a dark night. Acquaintance rape is when the perpetrator and victim know each other in some way. So that could be someone from church, someone from their work. Date rape, the perpetrator and victim are dating. Uh, marital rape is when the perpetrator and the victim are married to each other. And statutory rape is when the victim's below the age of consent. So they might have agreed to have sex, but if she's below the legal age of consent, the sexual activity is understood to be rape. You get a horrible concept of twice raped, and this is when, say, the, the medical procedure after the attack, it could be experienced as being violated again, an invasion over the body. It's as if you're being raped all over again. Or, uh, so she might experience this twice raped when she talks about the assault, when she someone asks her what she did to provoke the attack, when she's not believed by the person she confides in, if she's asked why the attack still bothers her, if it happened a long time ago. If her case her case is not prosecuted because of lack of evidence, if the perpetrator is found not guilty at trial, or if the lawyer for the perpetrator left him feeling humiliated, disregarded and invaded. Just think about you're in a court and you have to speak about what you've gone through, that, the most awful experience of your life probably, and you have to relive it, you have to speak about it. Um, and then the way you're talked to by the lawyer of the defendant is as if you're making it up. He's looking for, or he or she's looking for uh, putting the blame on you or why you're lying or it's not true. A horrible experience. And that's what's known as being twice raped. There are also some myths surrounding rape that people have in their minds. P people that are friends and family of the victim or maybe even the victim herself. Rape only happens when she's attacked on the dark street. Most rapes are actually committed by someone the victim knows. Or the victim deserves to be raped. It's when they say it was her fault for getting into a car with the perpetrator, being alone with him, or the way she dressed, that she's dressed provocatively. If you dress like that, how can you expect a man to be able to control himself, for example? This is a matter of wisdom. It's very unwise to dress that way. Or it could be, could be unwise to get into a car with someone. But... No one ever deserves or asks to be raped. That's just, that's, you do not deserve to be raped. There's a wisdom issue, 
but she does not deserve to be raped. A promiscuous woman is not a, a rape victim. So a woman's sexual history has no bearing on whether or not this incident was rape. I remember helping someone who, uh, who could not remember the number of times that she had slept with a man. Hundreds of times. But this one time, she knew it was rape and it was bothering her in an extreme way. It's a very big difference. All victims of rape, rape have been threatened with a weapon. So perpetrators can also exert force with the hands, threats, drugs and a physical body. So let's try and understand the impact. Uh, does this all help equip us? Again, it's a very basic lesson. Please look into more to be better equipped. Uh, go to uh, bodies that are available in your location to be able to help you uh, care for victims. But this is basic to un help understand the impact of rape on a victim. The first is the stages of recovery are known. So there could be a crisis or acute stage, and that's right after the rape. When the victim's in a state of shock, fear, anxiety, anger, and might not believe that what's happened to her has happened. Uh, and then that can move on to outward adjustment stage. That's usually during the weeks after the attack. And she could be in this for a for a long period of time. So the rape is actually controlling her life. So her behaviour and emotions in her body change. So she is getting on with her life, but the rape is controlling it. And people around her might think, oh, she's okay, she's moved on, she's doing okay, but it's not the whole, the rape is controlling our life. This is this is a time where we can really provide help in a wise way if we can bring, help the person know the Lord. The integration of long-term reorganization stages where life is adjusted um, to being looking different. So the physical, the physical symptoms Include scratches, bruises, welts, broken bones, dislocated joints, lacerations, knife wounds, sore muscles, sprains, strains, internal injuries or chipped or broken teeth. So it's important to, for her to get a medical examination because her health is in danger. And she might be resistant to this because remember I spoke about being twice raped. She doesn't want again to go somewhere where she's got no control over her body and someone's invading her. So you can't make her go and get a... a a medical examination encourage her um, but it could be this is a probably would be it's a reminder of the, the assault she does again get no control over her body and someone else is violating her it could aggravate existing conditions that she already has I've listed some of them here nausea headaches back pain stomach problems general bleeding tiredness pain and bleeding uh, urinary problems skin problems etc she could problems sleeping trouble falling asleep experience nightmares when she is and this will affect her physical health and we need sleep if we don't get sufficient sleep it comes to affect her physical health now she has nightmares <clears throat> and she knows that when she falls asleep she'll probably have a nightmare and, and probably dream about what has gone on you could resist going to bed so you'll end up exhausted and then have nightmares when you are uh, so you need a lot of help there with wh what she fills her mind with before going to bed. If you think of the emotion, all the emotion that's going on. People need to do something with their emotions. When you, when you go through deep hurt or trauma, people need to do something with their emotions. And a lot of people then engage in self-harm. So they seek ways to be relieved of these painful emotions so they could injure themselves and thereby releasing endorphins into the body to make themselves feel better. They could have eating problems, such as anorexia nervosa, where she's controlling her body by eating as little as possible out of fear of gaining weight, or bulimia, binge eating and vomiting not to gain weight. And both of these ways of eating, which are self-harm, cause serious health problems to her body. And it's a result of, it's a way that she's reacting to having lost control of it to someone else. And then she could develop addictions. And again, trying to feel better, seek relief in alcohol, drugs, food, exercise and cleaning, gambling or even having sex. Um, some rape victims who decide that they're going to have control over men and have sex with them because they they did that to her. Well, she's going to do it to them. Um, so her addiction will have adverse effects on her health, relationship, work and view of herself. And it's understandable. If you, you, you're you going through awful emotions, it's understandable that someone would then 
want something to feel better. And then when they do have something that makes them feel better, they go back to the next time that they're feeling that bad. And then just develop this way of t- of engaging with that thing that gives relief. So that instead of the, the, when they start needing more and more of it, and then they can't live without it, and then whatever it is that they've used to get relief is actually controlling their lives. It's understandable that this develops and grows. So, but the addiction is a is a result of what's going on in our hearts. So it's important to help what's going on, what what she's processing, how she's dealing with things. So that's a basic understanding of what someone experiences when they've gone through the awful traumatic experience of rape. And in the coming lectures, I'll give more information to help victims.